I mean, every guy in ESU I worked with, and I, I mean, and every one of them, I mean, there's a horror story behind, you know, who was going to get engaged in a week, uh, uh, who just had a baby, uh, who has three kids, who was going to retire this year. All the stories I hear kids asking mommy every day, when's daddy coming home? I'm sure along with thousands of other families. Um, uh, Rodney Gillis worked with us on Third Watch, Sergeant Rodney Gillis. I lost two of my officers, Bobby, Bobby Fazio and Maurice Smith. Tommy Langone from 10 Truck. Chief Downey, Al Fuentes, Bill Fian, Chief Gancy. Santos Valentin. Terry Hatton. Patty Lyons. Carlos Lilo. Richard Quinn. Eddie Diatri. Jack Fanning. Mike Curtin. Mike Kiefer. Pete Carroll. Dennis Mojica. Ronnie Clofer. Greg Froner. Hector Tovato. Uh, Brian McDonald. Joe Navis. Captain James Amato. Andre Fletcher. Liam Callahan. Jay Lennon. Jamel Marino. John DeLara. Lieutenant Mike Esposito. James Papa George. My friend Brian Bilcher, works in Squad One. You know, my brother in law, Lieutenant Robert Reagan. He was a great father. Got him, Rand, and, and Brian Sweeney. I'd love to sit and talk about Pete and Espo and all the other guys and all the crazy shit that they did, but it's like, you're not going to get to everybody. And I'd like you to know everybody. And that's impossible. So take us as a whole. In the aftermath of the tragic events of September 11th, all of us at Third Watch were struggling with the same question that was troubling many people in our nation. How to continue with our daily lives in the face of so much loss and grief. Like many New Yorkers, we had friends, family members, co-workers, unaccounted for. And we spent the long hours of that first day, the days that followed, and the weeks waiting for word of their safety and well-being. In our case, we had worked very closely for years with the wonderful firefighters and paramedics of New York's fire department and with the officers of the New York City Police Department. They were technical advisors, actors, background actors, and crew members on our sets and were an integral part of the extended Third Watch family. So after hours of discussion and debate, we decided that the only appropriate way to continue was to first honor these people by giving them the opportunity to tell their own stories in their own words before we return to telling our fictional stories. So we asked them to tell us what happened to them on September 11th and the days and weeks that followed. Now these interviews were shot in active firehouses and police stations throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn in the first week of October. So you're going to hear people talking in the background, and telephones ringing, and occasionally an alarm going off calling the men and women away to work. It's the real thing. So we ask for your patience with these small intrusions. We thank you for being with us this evening. These are the people that we portray on Third Watch. And this is the reason we portray them. Uh, on the 11th, I had just finished my midnight tour, so I left here about 10 after 8 in the morning, 8.15. And I was just normal day, you know, leave work, dry clean his post office, that type of stuff, running a few errands. And I heard on the car radio that a, a small airplane had crashed into the World Trade Center. I was on the New Jersey Turnpike coming into uh, the Turnpike Extension coming into Jersey. Uh, when my wife called me, she goes, have you heard the news? As I'm answering the phone, I'm looking over and I can see the smoke coming out of the, uh, out of the North Tower. Initially, we thought it might have been a small aircraft or maybe one of these stunt people that, uh, like the guy that landed on the Statue of Liberty. Uh, we really didn't know what we had. I was totally unprepared for the magnitude of what I saw when I turned the news on. And I realized immediately, I said to him, look, I hate to cut you short, but I said, I think I better get to work. I got in my car and drove a couple blocks to where I could see the Trade Center. And what I saw, I could tell it was no small aircraft that hit that building. So to have somebody closed down the HOV lane, have them closed down the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel except for emergency vehicles and uh, start out some additional equipment. Guys came running down and said, oh, I'll jump in the back of the truck. I grabbed my bag, some uniforms, my gun belt, got in the back of the truck. And I had everything but my pants. All of a sudden, the, uh, the, rain, the 
the citywide frequencies just started to uh, get extreme, extremely busy with units saying they're 63s, which means they're en route. So I tried to get on the air to find out what was going on, and um, finally they toned out an, ass an assignment of a, an explosion, a signal 1030 at the World Trade Center. Of course, you don't believe them, you think, you know, everybody breaking each other's chops and, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. And it's really, I mean, she looked quite hysterical. I was sitting on my couch having coffee in the morning, reading the newspaper, and, and the phone rang. It was a friend of mine, said, turn on the TV. I was like, okay, I turned the TV on, and there it was. The, the Twin Towers was, was burning. At first, they said it was a twin engine plane, and I'm, you know, so I thought, Eh, you know, this happened to the Empire State Building years ago. It, it's not that, how bad could it be? I went and called my battalion, and EMT picked up the phone. My, my co-worker, Lieutenant uh, Bill Melarano, who's a very dear friend of mine as well, he was just screaming, come in, get in here. So I went down the hall to the window, and I looked out, and sure enough, you saw the, the hole in the building. So we thought it was an accident. We thought it was probably like a small plane you know, accidentally crashed into the World Trade Center or whatever. And then he turns on the radio as we're going and, you know, we start listening to the news and everything and they're saying how it was a terrorist attack or, one, you know, big, you know, one of those 747 planes. And I was like, whoa. So I got partially dressed and and I actually ran a barefoot to my, my kid's school. I had my car, but I, but I ran into the school barefoot to try to find my husband because I don't know why, I just thought that he should know where I was going, and I he couldn't find him, so I left from there. And um, when he came home, you know, he saw the TV on. I didn't leave him a note or anything. He just knew that I was there. And uh, I had a very bad feeling about it. No, actually, guys on, in the firehouse were, were standing on the front ramp, and uh, they were uh, waiting for roll call. It was about quarter to nine, I guess. And they actually saw the plane dive towards the World Trade Center. I had heard something. I didn't know what it was. As I ran down the stairs, ran out onto the pier where the boat is berthed, and I saw the North Tower pushing heavy smoke. In an incident like this, everybody goes. And if, uh, and if you can't uh, get on board the apparatus, you got in a private car. But you, you got there. Everybody took in this alarm. And I got on the cell phone, and I called the dispatchers, and I said, do you have a job at the Twin Towers? And they said, yeah, a small plane just crashed into the tower. And as I watched, it just got worse. I mean, I could tell from my experiences that uh, it was a job and a half. We could see heavy fire from the north and the west sides of the North Tower. Heavy fire through the exterior skin. That's a bad sign in a high-rise building when fires through the exterior skin. I saw the hole in the building, and, you know, I just, just knew there was a lot of people up there. And, you know, I said a little prayer on the way down. And, try to keep myself calm and think about what we had to do. The only thing on my mind was, you, you gotta get there. You know, you gotta get there, get there, get there, get there now, get there faster, get there. We moved through all our tools and air scott bottles, anything we could find. We loaded into the truck and we packed everybody in, uh, into his truck and we headed out. I called the firehouse on the phone and Lieutenant Higgins had answered the phone. And I said, Lou, I said, uh, you guys going to this? And he said to me, uh, I said, Jimmy, as soon as I hang up the phone, we're on our way. I said, okay, Lou, we'll see you there. We're on our way in. He said, okay, I'll see you there. And that was the last that I heard from Lieutenant Higgins. I couldn't tell you how many um, guys and how many firehouses and how many homes, firemen, police officers, um, emergency medical technicians, how many people, like, didn't wait for the call didn't wait to find out what was going on, just went. Pretty much ran every light all the way through Staten Island. I got to the bridge just as they closed it. I was three cars behind the car. And I jumped out, ran up, showed them my ID. I said, I gotta get over the bridge. Two cars in front of me were firemen also. They did the same thing and they let us go. We, we sort of formed a convoy and we're going down the streets and we come up the intersections and we're doing, you know, like Popeye Doyle in the French Connection. You know, he's hitting a horn and he's gonna unmark car and everybody's saying, what the heck is, you know, and we're taking the lights, but we, we know what we have to do. We gotta get there safely, but as quickly as we can. They dispatched us to, to the Midtown Tunnel at that point uh, and, and 
it's probably what saved uh, my life and the life of my company is that uh, and I, uh, I have a tough time feeling good about that, but... But everybody got to the firehouse, they looked at the board. We have a board that lists all the guys that are working. Then went up to the office and looked in the book to see who was coming in. Being that, that it was 9 o'clock in the morning, we knew that it was change of tour. Everybody was here and everybody went. Uh, coming over the bridge, the Rosano Bridge, when I was coming back into work. Um, Rescue 5 from the fire department from Staten Island was just ahead of me coming over the bridge. And they had shut down the Staten Island bound Verrazano Bridge for emergency vehicles. So they cut across. And I was trying to get in work and there was traffic. So I, you know, identified myself and followed them over the bridge. And I remember looking at, at the back of the truck. And normally the rescue companies, I would say, ride with five or six guys. They were. I remember looking at the guy hanging out of the back of the truck, and he was looking down at me, and I was saying, wow, there's a lot of guys in that truck there. <clears throat> they, they, they're riding heavy there. And uh, not realizing it was their change of shift, you know, it was 9 o'clock. They were just swapping shifts, so I guess everybody jumped on the truck. And uh, I followed them over the Verrazano Bridge, and they never came back, not one guy on that truck. Hey, what you doing? Playing solitaire. I can take a hint. I chipped a nail. Try to hang on. I'll go for help. Wouldn't you love to go to Europe? Yep. Any reason's a good reason to get to McDonald's for mouth-watering new tastes like the barbecue bacon crispy chicken, covered with crisp bacon and tangy barbecue sauce. Or try the bacon and sausage bagel, loaded with hickory smoked bacon and savory sausage, each made just for you. Honey, do we have a... Trombone? No, I'll go buy one. Unexpected new tastes at your favorite place, now on McDonald's new taste menu. Every day can be a surprise. There's never a dull moment working here. I always had heard that Walmart was a good company to work for. Our number one goal is to keep our customers happy. That's 100% of your job. We laugh. We laugh at Walmart. We have fun. Walmart! It's very important to make the customer happy because the customer is number one here at Walmart. Just go over there with a smile on your face and that may turn their day around. It's like a family. It's like a big, happy family. I love coming to work every day. How many people can say that? Walmart is a great place to work for anybody. Okay, kids. Mom, when we have our phones. We can check in. Okay. Introducing the family share plan from Verizon Wireless. Now your family can share a ton of minutes on one calling plan. Hey, Mom, crimson or candy apple red? With up to four separate lines. Is 20 feet enough? Hurry in and buy one Nokia phone for $29.99 and get up to three free with activation. Honey, do we need an extra hand? And now get an extra 3,000 night and weekend minutes to share. Just call 1-800-2-JOIN-IN today. Now that's something the whole family can get excited about. Verizon Wireless. Join in. On November 2nd, you won't believe your eye. Would you listen to this? Blame it on the little guy with his one eye. The creators of Toy Story take you into the high-pressure world What's that? Yeah! of Monsters Inc. You little one-eyed cretin. Okay, first of all, it's cretin. If you're going to threaten me, do it properly. Billy Crystal, John Goodman. Where is he? <laughs> Monsters Incorporated. Lady G in theaters November 2nd. If new Body Smart was just a new nutrition bar with 17 essential vitamins and minerals, it would be dumb to show you images like this. But since new Body Smarts tastes as good as it is, good's not such a dumb choice. Introducing delicious new Body Smarts. Sweet just got smart. There's only one Amazon. There's only one jungle. There's only one mother. There's only one mother. There's only one past. There's only one future. There's only one Jeep Liberty. The next great Jeep idea. NBC Wednesday on an all-new ad. Do you think that you could change who you are? America's favorite Mr. Nice Guy has a new attitude. Holy Lord. I've never had a one-night stand. Hi there. Can a good boy go bad? Want to come in? 
Then, part two of the West Wing premiere. We're gonna write a new book, right here, right now. In the midst of a crisis, a campaign begins, and someone may be left behind. Well, I think it'd be a good time for me to resign. An all-new Ed, part two of the West Wing premiere, and an all-new Law & Order Criminal Intent, NBC Wednesday. Everyone wants to know how Ross and Rachel hooked up. Thursday, the answer's on this tape. You don't want to see this, do you? Friends, part four, NBC Thursday. Tomorrow on NBC Nightly News, the truth about airport security. They say they've made changes, increased protection. But what really gets through these screenings? You won't believe what we uncovered. Also, an exclusive interview with Tom Ridge, the president's homeland security czar. NBC Nightly News tomorrow. The alarm started to roll in at 8.43 on Tuesday morning. Fire and police units from all five boroughs responded, with Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island the first to arrive on the scene. Well, we were up there that morning at 8 o'clock in the morning on the 77th floor and uh, had a meeting there for about a half hour. Went downstairs, um, got in our car, we exited the parking garage, and I was driving west, uh, south on West Street. And we heard a roar. Next thing we looked up, and it was a big ball of flame above our heads. Uh, and I began noticing debris was falling down onto, the street, onto West Street, and some of that debris was hitting vehicles. We figured we held the wall, and the stuff would bounce off the wall behind us. And you heard bing, bing, bang, then plop, plop, and the plop, plops were body parts, and it was like uh, seeing decapitated people and just pieces of bodies and, you know, ribs. Unbelievable. Our normal procedure would be that we have a command post as a fire safety station in the building, so our first arriving units would go, go there. The chief, there's a chief that would assemble them there and then send them up to the upper floors, in this case, for an evacuation. Our objective as emergency service in, in that scenario would be to try to uh, get people out of the building, uh, of course, you know, try to, uh, you know, get people away from the scene and to set up some sort of triage. On the way down there, I had the radio on, and you, know, you could see it was, it was developed, and now when they talk at a commercial airline, I still think an accident. Now, when we pulled off, our staging area was Church and Vesey. That was our mobilization point for all the emergency service units. And I jumped out of the back of the truck. That was the first time I looked up and I saw it. And I said, man, this is, this is big. We grabbed all the equipment. We had scar packs, breeding apparatuses that we had. Uh, we had entry tools in case we had to uh, open up some doors. And he looks down on the ground and he says, oh, you know, oh, look at the birds. You know, they didn't make it. And I looked and I says, that, that those are not birds. You know, that's, you know, human body parts. Uh, Kenny Winkler, who's on the uh, side already, uh, he told me that there was a, a, a person down around the corner on Vesey Street. Uh, so I grabbed the first aid medical bag and I, I ran over to him. Along with who came right after me was Brian McDonald, who, who was missing right now. Uh, apparently, he, he had, it looked like he had gotten struck by uh, uh, airplane parts. It looked like pieces of an uh, aircraft engine laying around him. We carry extra equipment for high-rise fire cylinders and search ropes and things like that. So as we were getting our equipment off the truck, there was actually small explosions taking place above our heads. There were a lot of people running around the street, and a lot of people were, in, were panicking. Uh, some were going north, some were going south. Uh, people had already abandoned their vehicles in the street. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel uh, uh, was slowed down. I guess they were setting up the detours and everything, and traffic had actually stopped at one point. And um, suddenly, uh, I saw a low flying jet coming in. And then it started to incline and pick up speed. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe the pilot is, uh, is a good pilot. And he's taking his passengers for a wild ride, but he's flying around the black cloud of smoke rather than flying through it. And instead, he just, uh, he just banked to the left and drove it right into one of the towers. And you saw this huge um, fireball. And I remember looking up at it and seeing pieces coming out of the building. And it actually looked like confetti or ribbing, ribbon. And watching this, it was, it was like in slow motion, just standing there looking up at it. And I realized it's, it's, not, you know, it's not paper that's coming down. 
I grabbed the woman um, who was just staring up at it also. I grabbed her, I threw her behind an ambulance, and the metal had started falling, hitting the ambulance, hitting all around us, and it was pieces of metal 15, 20 feet long. The second plane hit, and the shrap metal started coming all over us um, from the plane, and well, we dove under an uh, overhang, and uh... when the second plane hit, uh, we actually took cover because there was, at that point, there was heavy falling debris that was coming down. Uh, I noticed a large airplane tire fall right in front of us. It was burning. The rubber on the tire was burning. Um, there were some uh, actual torsos and, and body parts that were coming off and falling onto the ground in front of us. As I was walking uh, towards the command post, I was trying to size up the situation, and I'm looking up, and you know, both towers are fully involved on the upper floors, and uh, people were people were jumping, so I, I knew something. You know, this wasn't going to be a uh, a normal assignment. Just started rescuing people again, telling them get away, get away from here. People started to walk toward West Street. Said you can't go down there. And some people said I got to get down there. My car's down there. I said get out of here. You're going to get killed. Something's going to fall on you. And as I was running out, I saw what, for some reason, my mind thought was a mannequin. You know, it was a jumper down. And, you know, it was just your mind playing tricks on you. It was just because, you, you know, you're not ready to see that, as you, you know. And, you know, in that, split sec in that split second that I thought it was, you know, you thought it was a mannequin, and then your mind, you know, then, you know, then reality kicked in. You know, I don't know if it was a tenth of a second, but I just remember thinking, mannequin, no mannequin, you know. And I've seen, uh, you know, in this job, in the, in the years that I've done it, I've seen jumpers, but not in the amounts that I saw. These are things that my dreams bring back to me. Like there's a lot of traffic on the radio. I don't know how clear it came over, but some people said that they heard the message. And they just said, you know, Central, we're, we're, under, we're under terrorist attack and to uh, notify the military and to notify the Pentagon. Uh, I got to General Square and one of my lieutenants just said, don't even worry about putting your uniform on, just get something that identifies you as an officer and go. The chiefs were kind of overwhelmed. It was big, you know, and they said, well, right, we're going to start working our way up the beast there, well. And, you know, I, I, I kind of knew as we were going that we were going to be walking upstairs. I just, you know, I, I'm just thinking to myself, that's, that's 95 floors. You know, this is going to, this is, this is bad. <laughs> Once we got through the doorway of the stairwell, it was actually pretty orderly. And the people were, were coming down. They stayed to their right. We stayed to our right. They were very orderly. Um, you know, to be expected, of course, they were, you know, some of them were in shock and, and, and uh, you know, just distraught about the whole thing. They were passing us. They were uh, making comments like, you know, God bless you guys. We really appreciate what you guys do. I saw people carrying people down in chairs. You know, people were, uh, offered to help me carry something, you know, they <laughs> wanted to help me carry something up the stairs. And I was like, you know, thanks anyway. They were actually handing us bottles of water and things like that. For, the walk up. And as we were going up, we were basically giving the water back to the injured people so people could you know, put them on their burns. They were telling us uh, what floors they were coming from, and we were asking them what damage was on that floor, if any. I remember somebody saying, be advised, it's a one-hour climb to the 31st floor. I hear a lady asking people what floor you came from, and uh, I remember the last person, the female, said 81. People being evacuated. Uh, People were walking with like one shoe and just with no shirts on, and, you know, just running out of the building, the, f the fear on their faces. And uh... we stayed together as a group, as our company, our six guys. But a lot of uh, a lot of people got separated because uh, as as people were bringing down the injured, uh, a lot of these people were burned. Uh, they were actually burned very badly, and uh, some people to the point where they had. Uh, virtually no clothes on. Horrific injuries. I have never, I mean, as like I said, I'm a medic in the city 18 years, and I have never, ever seen traumatic injuries like this. Uh, burns coupled with massive open traumas, bones, lacerations, avulsions. Men in sport coats were actually taking their coats off, wrapping the women up so they would, you know, uh, have some privacy. And uh, 
basically just leading them down. But as they were leading them down, it would take a person to help this person, and that would stop us because we'd have to wait till they passed us in order to go up. So we all kind of got separated. Um, eventually, there were companies on about the 42nd or 44th floor that I know of, and we were only we only ever got up to about the 27th or 28th floor. I remember at one point speaking to one lady and saying to her, you know, she was having trouble breathing. I said, how long have you been walking? And she said, oh, I've been walking about a half hour. I said, really? I said, what floor were you coming from? And she said, the 50th floor. And, and, and it's, it's, it's weird because in, in the midst of all this, this madness, I say to myself, uh, wow, those people on the top, they got no chance. Very proud of a lot of people that were coming out of that building because they were uh, strong people helping those who were injured or weak. Um, everybody stayed together very good. Working our way down and, you know, as we're going down, we're opening doors to see if there's any backup of people in the hallways. There's a couple of doors that weren't, that we couldn't open from the stairwell, so we forced open a couple of doors, we didn't see anybody. About after a half hour, some of the people, it's the flow of people come to a trickle. I believe a lot of people got out of the North Tower. Well, all the people in that, that area had been, uh, that, that were coming out, had come out. There's uh, no others in the, in the building that we could see. I was engrossed in, in trying to organize the, the patient care and the units and the other supervisors and the EMTs and paramedics. And you just heard this horrendous, thunderous roar. I never experienced an earthquake, but from what I've seen, that's what it felt like. Uh, the floor shook, the ceilings fell, the, the lights went out. I heard this thundering of uh, I mean, sun, I've never heard before just this thundering sound, continuous thunder. Sounded like a jet engine was coming down on us. It was unbelievable. And I turned and I looked up and I saw building number two begin coming down. And again, you hear people yelling, the building is leaning. By the time I turned around and looked, this is how fast. I didn't see no building. I just saw like a roar in a way, for lack of a better word, of debris and dust coming our direction. I'd been waiting for a day like this. A day when an all-in-one wireless plan would make things simple for people. The Sprint PCS Total Digital Connections plan is here. It brings all the best features together. Clear calls, nationwide long distance, voice command, and wireless web. Thanks, boy. And now, it's my job to tell the world. Total Digital Connections Plan, only from Sprint PCS. Whoa, whoa, did you bake this bread? Do you have any idea where it came from? No. Don't you just love the smell of fresh baked cardboard? Subway bakes their bread fresh every day. Subway's got four new delicious Subway selects, like the tasty Southwest chicken. Subway! It's LensCrafter's best $99 offer ever. Right now, get a complete pair of glasses with DuraLens, our most scratch-resistant plastic lens for only $99. The $99 DuraLens event. This is one you don't want to miss. and Dogs, available October 16th on video cassette and DVD. Critics call Cats and Dogs outrageously funny. We are trying to take over the world! Two thumbs up. Are you ready? Sir, yes, sir! Cats and Dogs, October 16th on video cassette and DVD. Rated PG. Cats rule. AmbiPure's newest idea in bathroom freshness is new AmbiPure Sparkling Fresh. The first two-in-one liquid air freshener and bowl cleaner. Cleans the bowl and fills your bathroom with that just-cleaned fragrance. New from AmbiPure. Anything in the mail? Hmm. Junk. Hey, look at this. What? A credit card pre-approved. You know what that means. We already have a credit card. But it's pre-approved. What do you want? A trip to Bermuda? The Caymans? Yeah. Or uh, a nice dinner around. You know what I want? A house. Using credit wisely is the first step toward owning a home. Call for the free guide on credit from the Fannie Mae Foundation and for a list of lenders and credit counselors.
This is Third Watch on America's Most Watched Network, NBC. Next on the highest rated new drama, Crossing Jordan, an exotic dancer murdered. This was about rage, control. How do you catch a twisted killer? Badges. You don't need no stinking badges. By becoming his prey. He killed him. Good luck proving it. There's always a way. All new Crossing Jordan, NBC Next. Dateline Tuesday. Kidnapped. Hostages tell a frightening story that takes you inside a terrorist camp. On all new Dateline Tuesday on NBC. You're at a stoplight. You're making a turn. You're pulling into traffic. There are a lot of reasons every 2002 Saturn L series comes standard with head curtain airbags. Those are just a few. The Saturn L series. Get 0% APR financing on all Saturn models. For restrictions, see your retailer. There's got to be a better way to get to Salt Lake City. And now with Verizon, there is. Every time you make a long-distance call or use these Verizon services, you're entered to win a trip for two to see the USA National Luge Team compete. Don't have Verizon long distance yet? Just call to sign up. But hurry, your chance to win ends soon. Verizon. One local fire department's new tool against bioterrorism at 11. Bessie Street on the north, Church Street on the east, Liberty Street on the south, and West Street to the west. Units from all over the city and now off-duty firemen and policemen had arrived at hastily assembled command centers and staging areas directly underneath the towers. Dark, acrid smoke was pouring from the upper floors of both buildings. I was talking to Tommy Urban, he's the sergeant from the apprehension team, and we were just going over what our plans were going to be, and he was saying he didn't think the tower looked too stable. And we're waving to people, let's go, let's move it, let's move it. And I'd say, like, maybe less than a minute had passed, and that's when we saw the lights flickering, and it felt like, a, like an earthquake. And that's when we heard this unbelievable roar. It sounded like a jet engine was coming down on us. It sounded like the turbines on a jet. I was standing on the runway, and jets were just landing right over my head. And I remember I, I looked up at the tower, and I said to myself, what the hell am I doing here? I heard people scream. And what you hear is what I heard is this, this giant rumble. I could see in the corner of my eye get dark real quick, and you heard a rumble and people scream. But with that, I turned to my right to look down, and I could see the wind come across this way. Which was odd. I mean, you're not used to be able to see the wind, but it was just full of such, you know, papers and dust and debris. But it was just a, it was a force, a burst, and things swang in the wind, and then all of a sudden, glass broke. And uh, I, I looked down, and they started screaming. I heard these people screaming. I heard a lady, oh, my God, I remember that. And we could see this giant cloud that was forming and coming towards us. So uh, a few of us, we just hit the deck. We tried seeking cover behind uh, truck six and truck eight, the two large emergency trucks and the ceiling started falling, parts of the wall started falling. And I knew something was wrong. I knew this shouldn't be happening. And it dawned on me, this building's collapsing. It seemed that just the smoke that was like a thousand feet high started to descend. And it came down slowly in the beginning, but then it started picking up speed. A few guys ran and we kind of got everybody in a, in a different way. I wasn't really sure what happened to everybody. And then I was laying down on the ground. I, I really thought it was, you know, No, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be anything good was going to happen. So, of course, the fi you know firemen were all over the street. Port Authority, police, New York City Police Department, uh, EMS, many, you know, many office workers. So uh, 
Oh, I recall we started yelling out, run, run. So Walter was bailed out of the truck. You know, and like every, everybody else who was on West Street, we just started running as fast as we could away from it. We took cover against the walls, any place we could possibly get cover against the walls and everything. I turned to run. I took about three steps with that, the sound, like the freight train hit me. It sounded like a freight train coming up behind me and just threw me right down to the ground. And I braced myself coming down. I remember screaming my daughter's name, Elizabeth, which is, you know, like I was looking for her to help or encouragement or something or the courage to do this. And I just, bam, I hit the floor. Knocked my glasses off, knocked my helmet off, kind of stunned me. Um, I, I was a little bit winded from the, from the, from the, the impact. I remember getting up, I immediately looked to my left and saw this enormous debris, smoke, black cloud coming right on top of us. So you ran. It, it was like in slow motion. It, uh, it was a, a gray cloud followed by this dark black cloud of smoke. And I could see debris in the air, like it, like it was coming down in slow motion. I could see beams coming down. I could see glass. I could. I remember this big chunk of aluminum in the air. And I saw a 13 precinct cop uh, standing there. He wasn't sure where to go. I mean, there was no way of outrunning this cloud that was coming towards you. Very quickly, before I even got to the next intersection, like about two thirds maybe down that block, I was running. And then that was when the cloud overtook us and, uh, and when I really believed that I would die. It was first like a white smoke and then instantly utter darkness. And with that, the suffocation, it was so thick, it felt like a rag was being stuffed, stuffed down my throat. You find out later is the uh, pulverized cement. You know, you're inhaling uh, pieces, you know, like, like scrabble tiles of cement in your throat. It felt like a volcano coming through there with all the debris and everything going up your nose. It was like you were drowning with all the stuff in your nose and your mouth, and you just, I'm just sitting there saying, uh, this is it, I'm gonna die. He goes to me, uh, Lieutenant, I lost my radio. And we're like, damn, and I'm like, what? You know, like, your radio, we're about to die. And now you can start to feel things come down on you. You can taste it, you can smell this, this ash, this soot. I don't know what it is. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, you know, I'm gonna die here, you know. And then I'm thinking, but then I'm thinking to myself, I'm not supposed to, you know, this doesn't happen to me. I'm not supposed to die. Yeah, it was a tidal wave of uh, dust and debris and some, some heavy objects were actually, I could actually see the heavy objects flying past us. Fitzy and I jumped down the station and got to the first level and then there's a couple of steps going left, we held onto the rail and got blown in. You know, I couldn't hear any of the noises after that. It just got so quiet. I mean, it was just very eerie, just sitting under that car and not sitting under the car, laying under that car and not hearing anything. All you heard was firemen and cops screaming. They can't breathe and you couldn't even find them. Nevertheless, breathe on your own. For, for a moment there, I thought I was dead already. I thought maybe that's the way it happened. I, I got this calming feeling. I thought about my wife and I got this calming feeling that this was the time, this was it. I said, uh, you know, this one. You're not going to make it out of it. Uh, for some reason, uh, I opened my eyes. They were encrusted. I look and I see, instead of pitch black, it started turning gray. So I said, Fitzy, Fitzy, where are you? I called out my name, Fitz, Fitz. I says, Jimmy, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And uh, at the time, I thought that I was gonna, that was going to be it for me. And then about after a minute or so, I kind of realized that I was still around. and had to do something to uh, save my own life. And uh, I just uh, threw my face in my shirt and uh, went down to the ground. Put him over here. And I said, keep talking. I found him by his hand. I grabbed his hand and said, come on, we're going to get out of here. And we felt the way off the ball. When they tell you, when you think something, you know, when you think it's the end, you know, I thought about my mother, I thought about my wife, and my three daughters. and. Uh, I just kind of expected. I tried to get down as low to the ground as I could, and every now and then it would open my eyes, and everything was pitch black. And I was trying to restrict my breaths and try to breathe almost air out of the asphalt. And I don't know how long it went on. It, it seemed like it went on for a while, you know. 
and then I started hearing, you know, voices again, not radio voices, but voices, and things seemed like they were starting to clear up. Went down to uh, Broadway and church and went into the Alvo Pan store down there. The people were great, and they were just giving us water. We're flushing our eyes out and face and throwing up all the stuff in our lungs. And The South Tower collapsed. And at that point, it was like an earthquake, earthquake was hitting the, the North Tower. I just got in, I got on my radio, and I immediately started calling people out of the tower. I said, we just lost the South Tower, everybody out. We, had, we were still in the stairwell with, the, with the, this crowd of people coming down. And about, it took about 25, 30 minutes later for, for that whole stairwell to be, to be empty. So I said to Sergeant Mandelier, he says, you know, go over to ESS, ask him, you know, how bad is the collapse? And Kenny goes, uh, the whole building is down, it's down to the ground. I was trying to get Team 1, which was on the 31st floor, down to Sergeant Curtin's team. We got down to about the 12th floor, picked up some equipment, we left on the 12th floor. And right around the 12th or 14th floor is where we picked up, uh, we picked up a civilian, uh, Josephine. Our Lieutenant Murphy s uh, sustained severe injury to his hand where a piece of debris had gone falling off the building as he was talking onto the radio, nearly severing his hand. Um, he was injured. He was still able to group his team and lead him out. We were able to make it to the ground floor, and, and once we got to the ground floor, uh, the building started to let go at that point. It was just a, a run for your life uh, scenario. Our Sergeant Curtin's team didn't make it out. Sergeant Curtin was out, but then he went back in to get the rest of his team. It was at this point that North Tower collapsed. We heard this tremendous rubble, uh, rumble again. And the only way I, c I can describe it, it would be like laying between uh, railroad tracks and have a freight train come at you full force. It uh, threw, me, threw me down into the half landing against the wall, and I was actually p uh, kind of pinned in a standing position against the wall. I, I dove for the floor, uh, with the floor met the wall, uh, face down, and you could feel, hear everything br uh, break in, the glass breaking, the ceiling coming down, the walls crashing. I started to try to run, but you couldn't run because of the rubble, so I was just getting away from the North Tower and from this terrible sound that I heard behind me and the gray dust that was coming again. Josephine ended up, I would find her after the collapse stopped, I would find her covered in debris. There was debris across my legs. I was pinned against the wall. Then she was actually at my feet, and she, she would later tell me that she was actually holding onto my boot. As I was laying on the floor and all, all these noises are, uh, are around us, uh, I could feel debris starting to pile up on my back. Uh, and I said to myself, I said, well, I, I guess this is it. I said, and I said, uh, I say goodbye to my wife and my kids. And I'm firmly convinced that it was an act of God because I got knocked off my feet to the ground. I remember laying there on my stomach. I put my hands over my head and I said a prayer. And I said to God, please protect my family. And if you're going to take me, make this quick. I don't want to suffer. We uh, uncovered the debris off of her, and she kind of like rose out of the dust. And um, we figured out that I was okay, she was okay, and we started, you know, call calling other people. And uh, everybody in my company was alive. My first thought was, I'm not going to make it. My second thought was, six truck is is behind me. They're not going to, you know, that's you know your second thought. And then I just thought there are thousands of people in that building. You know, I just, it was just horrifying. And all I saw was that, that silhouette of uh, maybe 20 stories high. And I realized that, that the towers were gone. And I said to the guys, I said, they're gone. And, uh, you know, it struck me then that uh, that means all our guys are in there. And when the sound ended, the rumble, the roar, I was still here. And it wasn't because, the reason I think, I know that it was an act of God, it was because it was nothing that I did that made me a better fireman. 
than those other people in the street that didn't make it. Chief Downey, Al Fuentes, Bill Fian, Chief Gancy. They didn't make it and they were in that same street. And I know that there was nothing that I did that made me better than them. That's why I know it was an act of God that protected me. A fire chief's car pulled up to the corner and stopped right in front of us. And a couple guys jumped out, one was a chief. And he asked if there were any, any bosses, are there any bosses here? And uh, we were, three of the guys in our group were lieutenants. And they said, yeah, we're lieutenants, squad 252. And they said, uh, so the one chief walked up to one of the lieutenants and grabbed him by the shoulders. And he said, I need you to find me a chief that's alive. On October 26th. I have this patient who claims to come from a planet he calls k -Pax. It's about 1,000 of your light years away from here. Open your mind. You speak English so well. You should try speaking. And change the way you look at the world. Maybe you could show us how this light travel works. What do you mean he's gone? Kevin Spacey. Jeff Bridges. Your produce alone has been worth the trip. k -Pax, and at PG-13. Starts October 26th. you could return your dog back to a healthy weight. Feed her Ein's weight control formula in the blue bag. It allows her to gradually reduce weight by helping turn fat into energy, which could add years of splendid health to her life. Ein's, good for today, good for tomorrow, good for life. What's for lunch? Chicken stars. Condensed soup? You're an adult now. There's a better tasting soup. Progresso Chicken Noodle has all white meat chicken and bigger vegetables. See the difference? This is better. Now, about this glass. It's time to go to the better taste of Progresso. The stock market. A year ago, it was how high is high. Now everyone's asking where's the bottom. Janice has gotten through tough times the same way we've gotten ahead. Picking stocks one at a time. Looking for opportunities for over 30 years. Janice is looking right now to be in the right place when a downturn turns into a better day. Get there. Janice Mutual Funds. We all want something different. Some want consistency. Some want variety. Some like getting things in one simple package. That's why AT&T offers so many choices in long distance. To get the plan you want, call 1-800-ATT-4-U and talk to the experts at making people happy. Hey, Daryl. Hey, how's it going, Dave? How am I doing? You're a natural. Hey, you got an oven in there, guys? When you get that craving for Wendy's bacon mushroom melt... Coming through. That was close. With three strips of bacon and mushrooms in a cheddar sauce, you just have to get one. Hey, Dave, come on in. We gotta go get lunch. I'm starting to get the hang of this. He says he's getting the hang of it. <laughs> Wendy's Bacon Mushroom Melt. When you gotta have one, you gotta have one. Oh. Remember, Wendy's Pickup Window is open late, so you can eat great, even late. NBC Tuesday starts with an all-new Emerald. Bam! And on Three Sisters, one couple practices parenthood. We get a keg and invite some of the lady babies over. Another couple faces the real thing. There's a chance I could be pregnant. And all new Three Sisters after Emerald, NBC Tuesday. Susan! She said goodbye and took America's heart. This Thursday, she comes home. Susan, hey. Hi. <laughs> the ER welcomes back Sherry Stringfield. What's she doing here? Susan's moving back to Chicago. Nice to meet you. An ER event, an original is back, NBC Thursday. In a time of war, a group of freedom fighters chose to fight back. Uprising, NBC.
ABC Sunday in two weeks. It had been a brilliant late summer day. Bright sunlight, not a cloud in the sky. Now it was black, utter darkness, a darkness filled with dust and smoke. Forty-five fire engines and trucks were crushed and burning. Police cars were destroyed, command posts were wiped out. The most experienced men, the men in charge, were missing. The World Trade Center was just now a pile, a pile of rubble. And, and you were looking at that, and, and, and you know, it was still burning, it was very hot. And you just walked down, and I just couldn't believe that the whole lower Manhattan, like we once knew it, was, was not there anymore. By now, the dust had kind of cleared, and you were looking, and there was no towers. And that, that's when it hit me that through it all, I knew something terrible had happened. I, maybe the top half of the building fell down. I looked, and the towers were gone. It's too much information to absorb. It's too colossal to take in. All you saw was uh, debris everywhere, dust, and uh, people basically walking in, around circles in the days. And we walked around every block, and we turned every corner, and every time it was the same. There was nothing but twisted, twisted metal and steel, and uh, and one of the eerie things that that you realize later on was that there was no glass. There was no broken glass. There was no large chunks of concrete other than what was the street. The largest piece of concrete you, you found was about this big. And you know that that entire building was built of concrete and steel and glass. It was like walking through through a war zone. I mean, there were, there were fire trucks that were, I mean, crushed, ladders, aerial ladders snapped, uh, police cars just overturned and burnt, uh, city buses that were just shells. It looks like people, somebody just came in there and took pieces of steel from the Trade Center and threw it through these buildings. There was pieces of steel sticking in all those buildings down there. We knew that we had put in, I mean, there's a, at least, say, most of the fifth alarm assignment had been in the tower that came down. And, and it's reduced to rubble, so we know that, uh, it, it, I don't know if, you, if at the time we could, you know, really grasp it, but we know, uh, you know there's a few hundred firefighters and there's a hundred and something firefighters in here for sure in this one. There were rigs on fire. There was rigs crushed, but it was eerily silent. It was eerily silent, and, and that scared me. I don't know if it was just our ears, or uh, several people said it. When we came out, it was almost like coming out of your house after a big snowstorm. You know, there must have been noise happening, but it just got very quiet, you know? And you'd hear an occasional, help me, somebody saying that, and you certainly couldn't because you couldn't see them. And you, you just, you had no idea where they were calling from. I found this guy, Ramos, EMT Ramos. And uh, we saw each other, we, I supervised him, we hugged each other and we held on. And I grabbed him and I told him, uh, what we can't do alone, we can do together. We could get out of here. The street was lined with, you know, six inches a foot of paper. And when the North Tower collapses, all that paper begins to ignite. So now we have trucks on fire. We have fire trucks on fire. We have police vehicles on fire. We have our large trucks starting to take on fire. And everything was on fire. Everything was on fire. The, the, the entire place was on fire. I mean, there were fires raging around, and, and this ash that was now turning to, like, mud, this gray mud. So you're walking through the streets with this gray mud. And at that moment, you just stood there, and you felt like the gates of hell opened up. And you were standing right there. You didn't know what to do first. You felt like it was Armageddon, like it was the end of the world. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like hell. Hell, hell on earth. From inside the vehicle, um, I could see the ashes. Just it was like, like snowing, you know. But just ashes, like like as if a volcano had just erupted, and all all that is just coming down. It was something out of the movies. 
you know, I never seen uh, the dust or dirt was in the street, and it was like three inches thick. And every floor above the third floor was just engulfed in flame. Not the kind of flame you see coming out the windows, you know, that, that's dramatic, but, I mean, it was all within, sort of like you were looking through a, a giant barbecue. Seven World Trade Center was like, fully, like it was just, the entire building was like, you looked at the building, there was all kinds of fire in every window. And nobody was like even dealing with it. It was just like. And there flames, firefighters just exhausted and, you know, some even crying, you know, I mean, they lost, I mean, so many people in there, you know? But just things that you see, like there was, like fire trucks burning. And I said to one of the guys with me, I said, this is like the, the American flag burning. This is not supposed to be happening. We started digging underneath the cars, and we started coming out with bodies from underneath the cars. I guess people had come down to see what was going on and didn't realize that they were in danger. Me and, uh, and an officer, we went and opened the door, and you could just uh, see her partner was laying, he was limped over the, you know, the passenger seat and it was he was burnt and it was so obvious that he was dead and you know that's when it hit me you know this is real it felt like you were watching a movie and uh and then you when you came to your senses you, you didn't even know where to start you looked around and you said where do i even begin you know i i knew where i was at every Everything that had happened, I was aware of everything, but I seemed so confused. I guess as, as everyone else did, you know? By the time I got to my mask, I'd already ingested most of the um, debris and, and concrete dust that was flying through the air. I was trying to purge the mask and really uh, vomit out of the side of the mask to try to get a breath. Um, our eyes were uh, just in encrusted with debris. I heard a path along. One of our pass alarms. I was like, wait, 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 listen. And you could hear it, and I don't know where it was. It's very difficult to tell where they are when they're going off. It's like not easy, it's not an easy sound to pinpoint, you know, like to lock into. And it was just really, really faint somewhere, but it was somewhere like in there. And then we heard that there was a pass alarm going off, which is a um, safety device that we wear on our masks inside one of the Trade Center. Uh, buildings, the smaller trade center buildings. So we made our way up into there and we tried to get into that area. I believe there were munition rounds going off. So the fire had grew in intensity and there was a lot more fire and there were rounds going off, bow, 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 like that. And I said, this is where I heard it. This is where I heard it. We all stopped and listened and I couldn't hear it anymore. We tried to pick her up and slide her down the, uh, the uh, debris that had come, fallen in. And uh, we slid her down to the guys below us thinking, okay, small collapse, we'll get out of here. Let's get her out of here. And it, we can't come to find out that later on that uh, the guy, as soon as we got her down to the next level, the guys down there said that uh, there was no way to get out. As these alarms came in, the person, the chief in the lobby, you know, was running that, who was running that command post in the lobby, would have known who he assigned. But now that, you know, they're all trapped in the lobby there, that one. The commanding officer of emergency service, Inspector Watson, was coming down the block. And Eddie and I were walking up. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, boss, where's the command post? At the same time I was saying, hey, boss, he was like, he said, Mike, uh, oh, my God. And guys I work with started coming up towards me, and they, they grabbed him by the arm, and they're going to get the Scott Battle off him. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm all right. And they're saying, no, you're not. You know, and then, uh, I think I started worrying I had something sticking out of my head. Or, my ear was hanging off or something, the way they were reacting. As soon as you saw somebody that you knew that you hadn't seen, you gave him a hug and said, thank God, you know, you're alive. In the middle of all this thing, when we were going out doing some searches, I ran into my brother. My brother's a fireman. He, he, was, uh, he wasn't working that morning. He, got, he, got, he had gotten off a short time before. And I ran into him in the middle of the smoke and everything, and I saw him. So it was a, a pretty tearful reunion. And uh, the girl put oxygen on me, uh, the paramedic. She came over, put oxygen on me, said, oh, just take a couple, you know, stay here a few minutes. And I said, well, okay. And uh, I didn't feel anything. 
And I said to her, I'm not getting anything out of here. And she said, uh, oh, it's empty and we have no more left. You know, and I was like, boy, I don't have the luck of the Irish here. The triage center was set up. We got help from everybody. Uh, but one thing that was striking was that there were no patients. There was nobody. A few police officers, a few firemen start to show up. Then I started running into a couple of the EMTs and paramedics who were in the, in the sector. I said, have you seen, did you see that fireman that went in with us? No. Did you see that crew, the 18 Charlie crew? No. Well, what about Chief Brown? No. What about his aide? No. And you look around, there's nobody around except for all this debris. It was TAC-2, which is a, you know, a um, kind of a special equipment vehicle, almost like a, like one of these big Con Ed, Con Ed trucks, you know. Um, and it was, it was twisted like a pretzel, like a pretzel. And uh, I looked at that and I said, my God, you know, who was operating TAC-2? After we got ourselves together, all the emergency service uh, units regrouped. Uh, to get some kind of a account who might be missing. And then the names started coming in of everyone that was working, all our friends and all the people that we worked with. And, uh, and as the names kept rolling in, it would, one after the other after the other, it was, it was overwhelming. Naturally, we all just kind of gravitated towards West Street then, once we started finding out that that's where our truck was and we knew that then that's where they had gone in. I don't know what time it was. You know, we lost track really at time at that point, but a few hours later, we all ended up in front of our rig. pizza stuffed into a bite-sized roll. Totino's, it's how kids help themselves. Oh, Gary, it's incredible. I, I thought you wanted to wait. What made you change your mind? Well, it was on sale. Sears Days, a sale so big it only happens twice a year. We're gonna have a life together. A house, a yard, a baby. Big savings you want on the top brands you need or might need soon, only at Sears. Where else? Okay, kids. Mom, when we have our phones. We can check in. Okay. Introducing the family share plan from Verizon Wireless. Now your family can share a ton of minutes on one calling plan. Hey, Mom, Crimson or Candy Apple Red? With up to four separate lines. Is 20 feet enough? Hurry in and buy one Nokia phone for $29.99 and get up to three free with activation. I mean, do we need an extra hand? And now get an extra 3,000 night and weekend minutes to share. Just call 1-800-2-JOIN-IN today. Now that's something the whole family can get excited about. Verizon Wireless. Join in. Now on DVD. I'm going to make him an offer, Captain. Own the Godfather DVD collection. You'll be able to see and hear it like never before with over three hours of bonus features. The Godfather DVD collection. Buy it today. Here we go, throw it! Throw it! Oh! That is pathetic. Hey, those are our kids you're talking about. No, I'm talking about your ordinary fast food. Boring, lifeless, wake me when you're done eating. Or you could try KFC Honey Barbecue Wings, drenched in the Colonel's tangy yet sweet sauce, full of intense flavor. Hurry, get eight KFC Honey Barbecue Wings for only $2.99, or 20 for only $6.99. Oh, towel boy, little help here. This gives me so much joy. <laughs> there's fast food, and then there's KFC. This is Third Watch on America's most watched network, NBC. On an all-new Frasier, Roz in love with a garbage man. No jokes, please. Even in his off time, he's taking out the trash. He has a thing for Roz's cam. <laughs> then the season's best new comedy, Scrubs. Are you a good doctor? Kind of too soon to tell. <laughs> An exceptional episode. I'm ready. That will touch your heart. Everybody dies sometime. No, they don't. I'm ready to go. 
Scrubs after Frasier. The best hour of comedy on television. NBC Tuesday. 32 years ago, the lunar expedition landed the first man on the moon. Last year, the Ford expedition made a new kind of history. It was the first and only SUV in its class to receive a dual five-star safety rating. J.D. Power & Associates ranked it the best full-size SUV in initial quality. The expedition even outsold every other SUV of its kind. And now, the 2002 Ford Expedition. Because there are no boundaries. It's the peace of mind that comes with a four-year, 50,000-mile bumper-to-bumper limited warranty and complimentary scheduled maintenance. But most of all, it's the peace of mind that comes with knowing it will never be mistaken for anything else on the road. The Jaguar S-Type. Lease one for just $4.99 a month. The child of a network news worker tests positive for anthrax at 11. The chaos of the first hours slowly gave way to organization as men and women picked through the mountains of rubble and steel. Fires broke out underneath them as they worked and raged in the buildings surrounding them as night fell. As other buildings threatened to collapse, rescue workers were constantly on the move, looking for any signs of life. You know, the size of the, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, the pile of a uh, busted up building went blocks. Truck companies, engine companies, squads, rescues, whoever, whoever was there, they tried to get all the forces together to get in to make some kind of search to find any of our brothers. We knew the guys were there and we were hearing different stories on where they might have been and we wanted to get in that area and start looking for them. Make a search, see what you can find, see if anybody's around. We checked all the buses, fire trucks, looked under the fire trucks that we could see, but there was just steel laying everywhere. And we just kept looking for a real long time. I said a few hours later, we all ended up back together and in front of our rig, and, and somebody had already, because <clears throat> the rig was crushed and it was full of dust, and somebody had written the names of the guys who were working. In, in the dust. But there was a lot of fire going on, a lot of chaos. People were worried about the rescuers getting hurt, but we figured the first few days is when we had the best chance of finding uh, people alive. We were searching through the pile, and you know we got into some voids where the steel makes when it comes down. It doesn't actually collapse to the ground. It makes different kinds of openings where you would crawl into and see if anybody was in there. Um, some were hot and smoky, but most of them were uh, just talk. Crawling around on the hot steel was glowing red still in a lot of places, you know, and, you know, it wasn't crawling through any visible fire, but everything was still hot enough that you didn't want to stand still. You go over this piece of steel, under that piece of steel, around this piece of steel, go down two steps, up and around. You have to remember how to get out. You went as far as you could till you couldn't fit no more. Then you came out and went into another hole. I got into a couple of real deep voids and still nobody. And at the bottom of the subway tunnel, there were two cars completely crushed and all the debris on top of them and the water was up to our waist. We were just hoping to find a void, hoping to get in, hoping to save a brother. You know, there was a bar down there, I searched the bar and found some helmets and heard some pass alarms in the rubble, but you know, just couldn't get to them. There was a dead end search rope that we found, it just dead ended under a pile of rubble. So we started pulling the, the rubble apart and got to a certain point where we couldn't do a steel and we couldn't move the steel. But we didn't come up with anything. And then the iron workers showed up and I, I gotta give them credit. They, they did an incredible job. You know, we were just looking for anything, any survivors. 
5,000, 6,000 people, there should be people, victims everywhere. And we were all kind of shocked that we're not finding nobody. Where are they? Where are all these people? I'm digging my hand for three days, and I have found no one. We were at our worst feeling. And I look up to have a camera put in my face. And the woman didn't move. She sat there and focused to capture the moment. And I said to her, in a few choice words, how intrusive that was. And not only did she snapped her picture and, and said, oh, OK, thinking she was walking away, she took two steps back, sat down again, and said, just one more. And to me, that was, you know, why not take a knife out and stab me? Uh, I put my left hand on the wall, and I was walking in total darkness. And I, I know I had people behind me because they were holding on to my shirt and to my belt. We tried to pick her up and slide her down the, uh, the uh, debris that had come, fallen in. And uh, we slid her down to the guys below us thinking, OK, small collapse, we'll get out of here. Let's get her out of here. All right, so I had my hand on, on, on the edge, which I thought was the doorway. And I went to take a step. And I didn't feel anything. There was no f floor right, right where my foot was. We finally gave a mayday over our radio, but initially people weren't hearing our maydays. I was yelling to the others to back up, you know, go back the other way. So we managed to turn around and with our hands, our hands on the wall, uh, walk a distance back. Uh, during the whole time we were trapped, they must have asked us uh, probably about 12 times uh, where we were. And we kept saying to them, we're in the front, you go through the front door, you make a right, you go about 50 yards, and that's where the stairwell is not having any idea that there was no more front door, there was no more lobby, there, you know, there was really probably no more stairwell. Uh, there was, there was little spots of fires that had broken out which illuminated the area. And uh, I was saying to myself, I said, the collapse didn't kill me. I said, that hole what was over there, I got out of that. I said, I said now, we're gonna, now we're gonna burn to death. I have no idea where they came from but they kind of rose out of the debris pile and they came and they met us <clears throat> and they initially tried to uh, tried to lead us out. And the way that they had come in was now engulfed in fire. Through the fires, uh, somebody thought they'd seen, seen light. Uh, I didn't see no light. I thought it was just another little fire that had broke out. We had no idea that we'd eventually be able to make it out until the uh, smoke cleared and, and we saw we were actually at the top of the debris pile. I don't know who exactly seen it first, but uh, somebody said, there's a way out over here. I mean, we were thinking, you know, I'm out. I'm thinking, OK, I'm out in the, I'm out in the air, you know, in the fresh air. But I'm, not, I'm still not out of this thing. If this building falls down further, you know, we're all dead still. So we, we started making our way out. At one point, we had actually had to uh, clip a rope onto a beam and slide down this beam probably I don't know, two, three, four stories down into the rubble, into a, like a cavern. <clears throat> we we uh, went across the cavern, and then someone on the other side of this cavern lowered a rope down to us, and we actually, again, walking, you know, uh, beams were in this shape, walking along the beams, uh, using the rope to pull us up, we were able to make it up onto the, what was originally, a wet, I guess, West Street. And it was at this point we still had probably another 200 yards till we were out of this thing. It was just amazing, you know, because the size of it was just, you know, every day you'd, you'd just kind of stand there and you look up and you'd be, you know, like awestruck and say, this is, this is amazing. We had, I think every FEMA team um, in, the, in the United States was activated and at times you wouldn't see them. When we got to a certain point going across the, the, the debris pile, Guys are like, where are you guys coming from? And we're like, well, we're the guys from Six Truck that are that were trapped. And guys just couldn't believe it. They they wanted to carry us out. 
And we said, okay, we're okay. You know, you don't have to carry us out. And guys from 263 engine, I tripped over a piece of metal and, and I fell. And they thought I was collapsing or something. And, you know, great guys. You know, I can't say enough for them. They picked the, you know, they put an arm, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. And they picked me up and, you know, they were, they were two smaller guys. They picked me up and carried me the rest of the way out. But unfortunately, out of the 18 or so people that I had started with at that location, uh, only six of us uh, walked out. We have one good story to tell, but there's, uh, you know, just for the fire department alone, there's 343 other bad stories. As I was going toward the pile, I was aware that um, Chief Gancy had died at the scene, and somebody had said to me that, um, that Deputy Commissioner Feehan also had died. And his son, John, is assigned in 252. And um, John was coming down the pile as I was going up. And he, um, he asked me, he says, uh, Jeff, have you seen my father? And uh, I tried not to betray what I was told. And I said, now, John, I just got here a few minutes ago. I, I, I don't know where he is. And um, you know, so he made his way back and we sort of passed. But um, I didn't want to tell him what could have been maybe a rumor or a conjecture. I'd been working for about 20 hours, and I looked down at my foot, and I saw this, this half-severed hand of a woman with her wedding ring on. And that's all there was. But, you know, I didn't know her, but, you know, I knew something about her at that point. I knew that she loved somebody and somebody loved her. And that's when I really thought, you know, this is, this is not a dream. This is real. The next several days and weeks, they're just uh, one repetition after another, going back to that trade center and looking for the six missing members of 252. This helmet's been sitting here on my lap for a while. This is Tommy Kovacs' helmet. He's still down there. He's still in somewhere in the rubble. We still got guys down there today looking for him. We've had guys down there every day looking for Tommy, for Pete Langone, for Terrell Coleman, for Patty Lyons. We found Lieutenant Timmy Higgins. We found firefighter Kevin Pryor. On the first day, we got a woman out of there, and um, we being the whole fire department, you know, it was a um, team effort, and uh, you, you were like a human chain. And we were handing the woman down, and it was probably maybe 100 yards or so that you had to go down ladders, up ladders, slide steel. It went on for four days. We, we kind of worked for like four days straight. We worked 24 hours there. Or I ended up getting home Thursday. We stayed straight down there for, um, I think it was eight days straight. Well, I got home at 3.30 in the morning. I had to be back at 6 the next morning, 6 or 7 o'clock. So I caught like two hours sleep and got back. We all wanted to come back. We had, we had friends in there. We know. We know their families. Now, my wife said, well, I, went, I was off duty, and I went in, and she said, why are you going in? You're not even working. I said, because when they find the guys, I want to help to carry them out. Uh, sometime, uh, I think on Wednesday or Thursday, we found uh, Pete Carroll, who was uh, probably one of my best friends. And looking back now, it's, you know, I'm glad we found him. So we got to put him to rest. And uh, then we found the captain, and they were in an area fairly close to each other. So we try and put two and two together, and maybe they were together. And you know, we we spent several days searching in that area to see if we'd find anybody else. Fathers digging for sons, sons are digging for fathers, we have brothers digging for other brothers. The other day they found, I think, 16. That was, uh, you know, we're hoping for the call. You know, it might be somebody from here to ease the pain, but it wasn't. I, I don't think we'll actually feel any normalcy till we get all of our guys, all of our guys out. The company that the, the member's from, they'll try and contact that company so they can come and, and either dig them, you know, dig the member out or, uh, you know, carry the member down. 
Something about shrouding the guys in the American flag, giving them dignity, and carrying them out. There's just something about that that's healing for me. We were finally going to buy my grandson a big boy bed. I was on chemo then, and I was exhausted. If you're a chemotherapy patient and feel tired, you may be anemic. Ask your doctor about Procrit to regain red blood cells. More red blood cells can mean more strength. Procrit is proven and safe. In studies, only diarrhea and edema occurred more often with Procrit than placebo. Procrit is for patients with non-myeloid cancers. He takes a lot of energy, but I never get tired of him. They are prisoners. You are no longer soldiers. With one man to lead them. They cannot take away from us who we are. Yeah. And one last chance for honor. Robert Redford, James Gandolfini, The Last Castle, rated R, starts this Friday. CSFB Direct, ranked as the number one online broker by Barron's and backed by the resources of Credit Suisse First Boston. That's the difference between online trading and direct investing from CSFB Direct. That's your new Kia Sophia? Yep, just got it. Well, I love my Toyota Corolla. I just got AC installed. Huh. AC came standard with ours. Power windows, power locks. Standard and standard. Does a five-year warranty come standard? No. Figures. But a 10-year warranty does. Plus, we got 2,000 cash back, which means we paid about 2,500 less than you. Oh my gosh, honey, are you okay? Wait, waiter? Hurry in and get $2,000 cash back on the 2001 Kia Sophia, now through October 31st. Now there's an anti-aging breakthrough that wasn't found in a lab. It was found in a plant. Almay Kynogen is different from AHAs and retinoids. Found in nature, it helps reduce signs of aging without irritation. Almay, the pure source for beautiful. Hey, what you doing? Playing solitaire. I can take a hint. I chipped a nail. Try to hang on. I'll go for help. Wouldn't you love to go to Europe? Yep. Any reason's a good reason to get to McDonald's for mouth-watering new tastes like the barbecue bacon crispy chicken, covered with crisp bacon and tangy barbecue sauce. Or try the bacon and sausage bagel, loaded with hickory smoked bacon and savory sausage, each made just for you. Honey, do we have a... Trombone? No, I'll go buy one. Unexpected new tastes at your favorite place, now on McDonald's new taste menu. This is Third Watch on America's Most Watch Network, NBC. NBC Wednesday, part two of the West Wing season premiere. We're going to write a new book, right here, right now. In the midst of a crisis, the re-election campaign begins. It's going to be a very close election. And someone may be left behind. I think it'd be a good time for me to resign. The West Wing season premiere continues, NBC Wednesday. Tanya, Darva, Cato. Next Monday, a special Weakest Link featuring America's most notorious newsmakers. Who's not used to being on TV without a lawyer? An entire show full of Weakest Links. You're right, but I didn't marry a millionaire. Weakest Link newsmakers, all new NBC next Monday at 8, 7 central. Sizzler steak and all-you-can-eat golden shrimp is just $9.99. Come and feast on mounds of golden shrimp. Then dig into Sizzler's juicy half-pound sirloin. Grill to perfection. You'll get a lot more than you pay for at Sizzler. Let's do it. These guys don't look so tough. Heads up. I got your back. On your left. Go, go, go. I'm hot, baby. Time to go for a spin. Gatorade. Bring your game to life. I'll take the big guy. Which big guy? We had a dream. And it was just like this. And it stayed that way. Forever. Forever. forever and ever and ever. Eternity for Man, Calvin Klein. Yes, forever. Your free gift with any $35 Eternity for Man purchase at Robinson's May. Daddy? Hey. Why are you eating my Cheerios? They help lower Daddy's cholesterol. They're good for Daddy's heart. Whole Grain Oat Cheerios is the only leading cold cereal clinically proven to help lower cholesterol in a low-fat diet. It's a cholesterol thing. 
One local fire department's new tool against bioterrorism at 11. There are so many victims of this tragedy. Thousands of families who've lost loved ones. Thousands of children who've lost their parents. In the chaos that followed the collapse, families waited for a phone call not knowing if their loved ones were missing. Uh, it was our anniversary and my husband was coming off a 24-hour shift and he was going to start his vacation. So um, I woke up late to bring my son to school. I called him, he said, I'm finished and I'll meet you at the coffee shop in 10 minutes. So I brought my son to school, I waited in the coffee shop and it was a beautiful blue day, I don't know, it was a blue sky and I started to see a plume of smoke coming and um, I immediately got annoyed because I said, oh, he's going to go to that, I know it because all the firemen, if it's a big fire, it's a good fire, if it's a big fire. When I saw what was going on, I called my wife, I told her I was going and she was on the cell phone screaming, you can't go, you're not working. And I hung up on it. <laughs> the last message I left my wife was uh, from the truck right before I jumped in the vehicle and went. I said, I got out of election duty. And I'm, on, I'm on my way to the World Trade Center. I'll call you later. No, I didn't wind up calling my wife till uh, about 4.30, quarter to 5 that afternoon, which was, she was kind of upset. He called me on his way to Brooklyn and told me that he was just going to go in and get changed and probably go straight to Manhattan. He'd call me later. I kept on beating him. I kept on calling his cell phone. I wasn't getting through. All the phone lines are down, and uh, one guy had a cell phone. I think it was, uh, oh, we had a cell phone in the truck. And uh, Franco Barbario was the truck chauffeur, and there was a line of guys there to make phone calls quick. I seen one person take a cell phone out of his pocket, and then, then it clicked. Uh, I said, I gotta call my wife. Right away she said, are you okay? I said, don't ask a lot of questions right now. I said, you know, we're trapped in the World Trade Center, I said, but we think we're at the top of the debris pile. Can you please uh, make a phone call for us? I told her I was all right. I said, I got all my arms and legs. No, I said, I'm fine. And she was, uh, to say the least, a nervous wreck. And she started to whimper a little bit. I said, don't cry now. I said, now's not the time to cry. I said, you gotta, you gotta do this for us because we're not sure that they're getting our radio messages. I kept telling him to be careful, like I always do. And he says, I'll be fine. And I said, you don't know what else is there. And he says, there's nothing else there. The worst is over. Really, I panicked when Joey finally got to me and I realized where he was. Joey called me an hour after Lorraine called. And he was crying. He was crying. He said that the call just came over and they're, they're going to dispatch, dispatch us down there. So that was the last time that I talked to him. and. He went down there, and then I'm watching, and the buildings are collapsing, and um, and then they keep reporting, you know, hundreds of firefighters missing, presumed dead, whatever. In the hospital, I guess a social worker or a hospital worker called my wife, which I knew once she got the call, fine and dandy. She knows I'm, you know, fine, I'm alive, but she's still, she's a worry of my wife. The six hours or so that I waited was torture because I thought he would have called long before then. He says, Ma, there are body parts all over the place. He says, I'm tripping over body parts. I said, listen to me and listen to me carefully. Do what you have to do, but get out of there. All my wife could say to me on the phone, she was crying, um, please come home, just come home, just come home. And that's the hardest thing. Tell her, uh, I can't come home right now. I just can't. Uh, about 7.30, quarter to 8 the next morning. He came in, exhausted, and just went straight in the shower. He walked in with his uniform and in a, in a, a bag. And um, I just, I didn't know what to do. I, I was thanking God that he came home. About uh, four days later, I went home. And you can imagine a uh, uh, pregnant wife at home and her husband's not home and circumstances, she was pretty upset. She uh, fell asleep with my picture in her hand. And I was surprised, I just, uh, I woke her up next to her. She was crying. I just kind of held it together all the way driving home. 
All I wanted to do was get him to hug my, hug my kids. That's what I did. Then I went upstairs and just sat by myself and cried. You know, I was furious and I wanted him to leave and come home. And as I'm sure every single person did, that had somebody down there that they loved. But, you know, I had the luxury if he did come home. And as soon as I opened the door, my wife heard the door. And I walked in and we hugged. She was never more beautiful or more precious in my life than that night. And I went upstairs. And without waking the kids up, I gave them all a kiss and a hug. I came back to downstairs. I talked to my wife again for about a half hour. And I said to her, hon, I've been here. I've been home. I got to go back. She was, uh, she hugged me and she said, I thought you were exaggerating. I was given a number yesterday that they kind of stopped me in my tracks, and I was at uh, as close to 15,000 kids who have lost a parent in this event. You know, and, and, and that is, that's just like, you know, you can't fathom that. We have 27 children from this firehouse alone that lost a father. It's a difficult situation because we don't have a body. We don't have any closure for us, so. You know, it makes it... How do you explain? How do you explain that, you know... I mean, I, my son doesn't believe me. He still thinks he's going to come out of the, from out from under the rocks and be fine. I picked up my kids, and uh, I went home, and it was just an eerie feeling, just so quiet. And I went to my in-laws, and just everyone was there. And uh, it still didn't hit. Oh, well, he's... Uh, He's probably there and helping people out. That's just the way they are. And uh, it still hasn't really sunken in what everything that has happened. It's like a tunnel. Just um, very dark and everything's going 100 miles an hour. Um, half of the company was at my wedding. And I now look at my wedding video and unfortunately um, see a lot of people who aren't there now. And with every one that we bury, if we don't, and I know everybody agrees that um, if we don't get our husbands back physically, that they're all together. And they need to know that we're together for each other forever. We've been together 17 years. We met in college. Uh, he was a sculpture major, so I had no idea I'd be the wife of a fireman. Um, after he, he's always been into saving lives. He was a lifeguard. Um, he, um, Sorry, this is hard. He, he was everybody's. I just borrowed him for a little while. So that was Mike. He was, he was everything. I used to call him my moon man. He's a cancer. I'm a Leo. He was the, he was the moon. Tom. <laughs> he was also uh, in the Navy Reserves. It's very important to him serving his country. Actually, um, he'd be upset with everyone that they're waving their flags now. They should have been waving their flags all along. When we were driving home from vacation this summer, we kind of had a thing where we go, if you could do anything, what would you do if you had money or everything the way you wanted it? And um, I had said I would go to graduate school for writing and uh, I would go to Columbia. And I said, but you know, we don't have time and we're too busy and we don't have the money. And he, um, I received a catalog two days ago in the mail that he must have called for, so. I felt like that was the sign. Mike was Mr. Mom. I never knew where he was during the day with the baby. He was at all the local shops. He was walking around the block. He would be here at the firehouse. And I'd say, what did you do today? Well, he was in a million places. And part of me is sad because he may not remember, he won't remember his father. But I'll make sure that, that he will in several ways, keeping everything, preserving a jacket, keeping newspaper clippings. Um, so, in one way, it's a mixed blessing. It's a mixed blessing. I want to use this time to promote firemen so that they can make more money. They don't get paid a lot of money. I think they need to make more money. Um, we struggled in our lives, um, and they shouldn't have to struggle. I think people are now aware that these guys are the bravest guys in the world. They would do anything for anybody. 
and it's time for the country to support that financially. It, it, it's always bothered me that someone can make a million dollars on Wall Street in 10 minutes, but I doubt any of those people would run into a burning building. It's overwhelming the amount of support yes, from the, the city, from neighbors, from friends, from family. And I guess I just wanted to say thank you. I had to tell my kids uh, they knew something was going on, and uh, just from family members and friends and support. And I just told them that we all love him and her, all our family, friends, and daddy's a hero. They're all heroes. They helped many, many people from that building. And they would, he, they would not want to be anywhere else. That was their job. That was their calling, just helping everyone. And they're all together. All the brothers are together. They're all looking at us. and. And together, how we are now, it's true. They are there together, too. The kids are fine. Why are you always so anxious? Dad, you're always so tense. Are you mad at me? Honey, you can't keep losing sleep. It makes you so irritable. You worry constantly. Can't we have a relaxing dinner anymore? Chronic anxiety can affect your relationships, your work, your life. If you're one of the millions of people who live with uncontrollable worry, anxiety, and several of these symptoms for six months or more, you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder, and a chemical imbalance could be to blame. Paxil, the most prescribed medication of its kind for generalized anxiety, works to correct this imbalance. Prescription Paxil is not for everyone. Tell your doctor what medicines you're taking. People taking MAOIs or thioridazine should not take Paxil. Side effects may include decreased appetite, dry mouth, sweating, nausea, constipation, sexual side effects, tremor, fatigue, or sleepiness. With the help of Paxil, you can see someone you haven't seen in a while. Yourself. Hey, I remember you. He claims to be not human. A visitor from another planet. On October 26th. Where is home? K-Pax. Celebrate the possibilities. Okay. She doesn't like it when you sneak up on her. No way. K-Pax. Rated PG-13. Starts October 26th. Call Domino's now and get a free order of our delicious cheesy bread when you purchase any large one-topping pizza for $9.99. Who would come up with such a brilliant idea? My idea. All mine. Make it a meal with wings and a two-liter Coke. Get the door. It's Domino's. Now on DVD and video. Do you own the best-selling, hottest action movie of the year? Time to go! What are you waiting for? <laughs> the Mummy Returns. Own it today on DVD and video. You know how you feel when you get on an old vintage bike? Speedy motorcycle. There's this very freeing thing that happens. There's a great energy with leather and denim. Speedy motorcycle. It's not about being tough. It's very liberating, romantic, modern, and clean. Speedy motorcycle. What we've done for Target is make the collection really fresh and affordable. You never forget your first leather jacket. In an instant, everything can change. Yet everywhere you look, the spirit of America is alive. That spirit makes us what we are today and what we will be tomorrow. We at Ford want to celebrate that spirit with the Ford Drives America program to help America move forward with interest-free financing on all new Fords. That's any new Ford car, truck, or SUV, now with interest-free financing. The spirit is alive with America's number one choice. Ford Drives America. This is Third Watch on America's most watched network, NBC. Next on the highest rated new drama, Crossing Jordan, an exotic dancer murdered. This was about rage, control. How do you catch a twisted killer? Badges. We don't need no stinking badges. By becoming his prey. He killed her. Good luck proving it. There's always a way. All new Crossing Jordan, NBC Next. Susan! She said goodbye and took America's heart. This Thursday, she comes home. Sherry Stringfield returns to the ER, NBC Thursday. Presenting the all-new Mercury Mountaineer with a brilliant third-row seat. Fold it down and it disappears, yielding a cavernous amount of cargo space. Raise it and seven adults can sit comfortably for the most third-row leg and headroom in its class. The Mercury Mountaineer. Ingenuity built cities. Now it brings you an SUV. Now get 0.0% financing on the all-new 2002 Mountaineer at your Mercury dealer. 
This house, the home store, has such great prices. They have the exact woven placemats I needed on sale. Oh, oh and that fabulous walnut table, also sale priced. No, no, oh, that... and those great goblets I've been looking for all over town on sale. Actually, and the most what? adorable shutters. Ma'am, this is some great sale. It's not a sale. These are our everyday prices. <laughs> yeah, right. House to home, great prices guaranteed on everything for inside and outside your home. Feels like a sale to me. He must be new. House to home, the incredible home decorating superstore. With four-wheel double wishbone suspension, the CRV is the SUV that drives like a Honda. While supplies last, get special APR financing as low as 1.9% for 36 months on 2001 CRVs. The child of a network news worker tests positive for anthrax at 11. Like everyone else in the nation, we find ourselves asking, what now? How do we return to normal? Will we return to normal, and what will normal be? The statistics are shocking and numbing. Nearly 6,000 innocent people murdered, tens of thousands of others injured. These numbers obscure the thousands of individual stories, the lives lost, who they were. They had families who loved them, friends, hobbies, foibles, and maddening idiosyncrasies. They were like all of us. They are all of us. And I remember driving over the Arizona Bridge and looking to my left. And it wasn't there anymore. The Manhattan skyline it was just not the same. And I, it was like a big void. And I remember looking to the right and seeing a, a Coast Guard ship, gunship, sitting under the Verrazano Bridge with the, with the gun uh, on the bow of the boat. You know, this is not something that a year from now we're going to be back to normal. It's our way of life has changed. When you can't drive into Manhattan without stopping at a checkpoint, your life, your life has changed. When you have fighter jets flying over, your life has changed. Not just 6,000 people. One person died 6,000 times that day, and it, it's really the truth. Yeah, why? You know, why? For what? You know, people at the desk, that's your big, you know, that's your big political statement is killing the person at a desk. And what, you know, what's that about? It's, you know. How do you do that? Where's the, where's the glory in that? Where's the honor in that? I know I've had a couple of nightmares, and usually when I was going to sleep, I was so exhausted I didn't remember too many, but there was a couple of nights I had some nightmares, and they were pretty scary. I just hope that they go away soon, and I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. My wife says that, you know, I wake up and I jump up. I don't remember a lot of it. No, I haven't been getting that much sleep. Not one of them, not one of them hesitated when it came time to go into that building. You know, were they scared, were they nervous? I'm sure they were, but not one of them hesitated. Those were the guys that were gonna go that extra step, that were gonna go that extra floor, that were gonna get those extra civilians out. And, and that's what they did. They got 25,000 people out of those buildings. And it's, uh, that's something that, that can't be overlooked and can't be forgotten. Those guys that ran into that building and, and are missing, the heroes, and they were heroes before. They went in there. Only now are they being appreciated, now that they're gone. Timmy Higgins, Kevin Pryor, Tom Kavakis, Pat Lyons, P. Langone, Terrell Coleman. I'm never proud to say I knew them and I worked with them. I feel lucky to be alive, but I feel, uh, I feel guilty uh, that you know, that so many others had to, um, had to die. You just look at, you just look at the poster inside and you'll see there's, there's, there's a father and a son. There are brothers. There's... There's a guy, Joseph Vigiano, works up in truck two. Not only is he missing, but his brother's missing, who's a fireman. I believe in Brooklyn. Uh, there's two sons. Their father is a retired battalion chief. He's there every night digging for two sons. Is that right? Gotta remember, this department lost 
just about every, every, apart from every operational component. EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, fire marshals, lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, division chiefs, chief of department, and first deputy commission. I know I have a picture here that Brian McDonald's daughter drew. Um, this photo actually was a larger photo that she had drawn herself and then um, was so moving that uh, one of the guys had it shrunk down and laminated for everybody in the unit. Um, when you see things like this that are so personal, uh, she drew another fo photo and he put it on the back there. When you see things like that, it's, it's almost uh, just heart-wrenching. These guys will never be forgotten, never, ever. And neither will their families, because we'll take care of them for, you know, for the rest of our lives. We'll always, they will always be included. They'll always be members of this firehouse, whether they're here or not. Their kids will always be welcome here. And, you know, you just have to get, you know, it's not easy. We're never, we're never going to get over this. So that's, you'll never get over that day. No matter where you go, people thank you for what you do. Um, they, they show sorrow for what you've, you know, who you've lost. And uh, it means a lot. You know, people are uh, waving signs at you, or, uh, you know, and clapping and cheering as you're going down, uh, you know, down West Street. Or you could be driving here and coming down the block, and you pull out, and they're waving American flags, and they're, they're cheering uh, the police. And We had literally push people out the door to shut the door at 12 o'clock at night. That's I mean, they were just coming, people donating. You can look around quarters. There's thousands of cards from schools. People are stopping by even now with sixth grade letters from their kids. And just to let them know, they are, they are being read. They are being looked at. Uh, they're hanging, some of them are hanging up in quarters. When we come in for a break, we're having a cup of coffee. If we're uh, having something to eat, as we're doing that, we'll just go through a stack of cards and letters. Uh, it just gives you that extra little boost that you, that you need for that day to, to, to get through it. People ask you how you're doing, and you can see that they really mean it, you know. How are you, you know. And then they'll ask you, how's your family, too. So, you know, people are concerned. And, you know, it, it's something good. It's nice to see, you know, Americans, you know, together and everyday people looking out for each other, too. When I got back that night, there was a, uh, I was out by the house watch, and a there's a kid, he came running up to house watch and he was like, he was having difficulty breathing and I'm trying to talk to him, are you okay, are you okay? And he says, I run, I run. I'm like, are you okay, are you, like, what happened? I thought either saw a fire or somebody was in trouble or something. I said, I run, I run, I run, make sure you're okay. Where are we going from here? I, hopefully forward, and, but I really don't know. You gotta hope things get better, and I don't know when, when they will and how much better they will get. We are entitled to live our lives as free people the way we always have. The fire department suffered a great loss uh, with all the people that we've lost. I mean, we've, we've lost great firefighters, young, up-and-coming people, people with knowledge and expertise. But we'll recover from it. it uh, you know, we'll recover because we will not dishonor the memory of the people that uh, was there, you know, that are missing. You know, the day-by-day -day things that happen, uh, I mean, are going to keep happening and get back to work and see our kids and spend time with them as much as possible. And hug them, hug each other. And remember that the most important thing is your wife and your children family and there's nothing else nothing he's got a cowboy outfit he's got a box full of outfits that he runs through every day and he hasn't worn anything but work shoes long pants and fireman shirts since this happened and my wife is kind of like but cookie we call him cookie because he's a real character I said cookie you have to wear something else besides work shoes, long pants, and fireman shirt. He's like, nope, wearing long pants, work shoes, and fireman shirt. I said, you know what, honey? 
I gotta go with them on this one. Am I upset and devastated by what happened? Yes. I'm gonna continue to uh, live my life to its fullest and uh, be a productive member of society, be a, be a good chief, be a good father, be a good husband. Yeah, and I'm definitely gonna be able to do that. That's the way I feel. Uh, do I need help doing it? I, I probably will. Some of the EMS people who, who survived the first one and ran out and got out went right back. They drifted back to the area to see if they could help. And they're already, so they're already carrying on. It's just an instinct to do that. And I think that's what's gonna, what it's going to be. We just went to a fire and it was like nothing can happen to us here. And this is, <laughs> this is a piece of cake. It just felt good. It felt good to get back uh, to some sense of normalcy. This tragedy, you're never, you're never going to forget this. Uh, you know, I spent two years in Vietnam, 17 to 19. So a lot of stuff over there, but like this. I haven't gone back. I didn't want to go back. I had that option, and I, and I chose not to. I guess for my own, my own mental health. As a paramedic, I help people. I treat and care for, and there was nothing for me to do. And I was done. What I would say to him, if I could, is that you didn't break our spirit. We paid a terrible price with over 6,000 lives, but you didn't break our damn spirit, and you won't. Oh, I have a lot of hatred inside of me for these people. Because I can't uh, believe that people would hate some, hate people so much to do something like that to innocent people. Somebody said earlier, it's a holy war. I'm a Catholic. Nobody ever told me in church to go out and kill somebody. It's not about money. It's not about hate. It's, let's love each other. Let's just love each other, you know? People around the world got to learn just to live and love each other. You know, that's, that's what it's all about, you know? A lot of men, women, and children and families, for what? You know? Same thing with war, for what? You know? <sighs> Say your prayers, and uh, hopefully God will help us all out. You know, that's what we have to do. It's just so far beyond my comprehension how someone, some ones, could do something like that to innocent individuals. I mean, whatever beef you have, that was just outrageous. And uh, it shouldn't have been.
Stay tuned for scenes from the next all-new Third Watch on NBC. My hands speak to me. They tell me secrets. They tell me of time and patience. At least, that is what my hands say. The all-new Lexus ES300. A new world of luxury. Whoa, whoa, did you bake this bread? Do you have any idea where it came from? No. Don't you just love the smell of fresh baked cardboard? Subway bakes their bread fresh every day. Subway's got four new delicious Subway selects like the tasty Southwest chicken. Subway! AmbiPure's newest idea in bathroom freshness is new AmbiPure Sparkling Fresh. The first two-in-one liquid air freshener and bowl cleaner. Cleans the bowl and fills your bathroom with that just-cleaned fragrance. New from AmbiPure. She wore white? She put her past behind her. But you're missing the point of the story. The groom's father-in-law hires him to run the mismanaged shipping department of the family business. No honeymoon? A week in Oahu. That's nice. It's not bad, but keep up. The kid turns to FedEx Ground. They give him affordable nationwide B2B delivery with a money-back guarantee. And he gives Daddy Dearest a high-quality, low-cost lesson in who's the boss. Who is the boss? The kid. The kid is now the, the boss? The kid is now the boss. That's the story? That's it. When I brought Alice home, Ralph and Ed weren't exactly thrilled. Hearing a catch out brand understood. They have mentors whose insights bring everybody closer together. Physical, emotional, complete. At any age, that's the Purina catch out way of life. It's LensCrafters' best $99 offer ever. Right now, get a complete pair of glasses with DuraLens, our most scratch resistant plastic lens for only $99. The $99 DuraLens event. This is one you don't want to miss. I'd been waiting for a day like this. A day when an all-in-one wireless plan would make things simple for people. The Sprint PCS Total Digital Connections plan is here. It brings all the best features together. Clear calls, nationwide long distance voice command, and wireless web. Thanks, boy. And now, it's my job to tell the world. Total Digital Connections plan, only from Sprint PCS. Wednesday, part two of the West Wing premiere. As the campaign begins, someone may be left behind. I think it'd be a good time for me to resign. All new West Wing, NBC Wednesday. Everyone wants to know how Ross and Rachel hooked up. Thursday, the answer's on this tape. You don't want to see this, do you? Flashback to the night it all happened. Friends, part four. Then it's TV's number one new comedy. Very lovely sweater you're wearing. I knitted it myself. Inside Schwartz, after Friends, NBC Thursday. Hate crimes mostly start with hate speech. So watch what you say, especially in front of your kids. NBC next Monday, the beginning of an amazing two-part Third Watch season premiere. New York paramedics, police, and firefighters relive the day before and the week after September 11th. Mom, what was slow down? Turn the TV on. The season premiere of Third Watch starts NBC next Monday at 9, 8 central. In the face of annihilation... 300,000 Warsaw Jews have simply been murdered. These were innocent people. They chose to fight back. We will fight our enemy now! Based on the true story... Of